So how how did this crazy journey start for you? Like what drew you to the guitar? I nothing. I wanted to be a drummer. Actually, oh, okay. that is uh, this is what so many guitarists say. And actually, yeah. Nuno Betancourt always says to me, because uh, he was a drummer first, and he's like, actually, you know, learning to play the drums is actually like having good rhythm is vital to be a good guitar player as well. So did, yeah, I remember, did you actually learn how to play the, the uh, drums or not? A little bit. This is the funny story. I'll keep it short. But when I was like 15, all my friends started getting guitars. Yeah. And I remember being in eighth grade and seeing the high school talent show. And these guys were playing like a Black Sabbath song. And they all had long hair. And I was like, whoa, like that is so cool, right? I was like, I want to do that. And everyone was had these guitars and no one was playing drums. And I was like, you know what? I remember listening to like, you know, classic rock radio and when whole lot of love, like the, the drums and everything. I was like, oh yeah, I can air drum that. I'll figure that out. So my brother's friend had a, had a drum set and he goes, I said, man, can I use that? I mean, I was a little kid. He's like, yeah, sure. I'm going to college or whatever. And uh, so I get this drum set. I bring it to my parents' house and I have um, my CD player all the way up, like right next to my face in our basement. I'm trying to play drums, right? With songs on the radio. My dad is like this hardcore construction worker guy. Like, you know, he walks downstairs. I can hear his boots coming down the stairs, you know, and he walks down. He looks at me. It's the only time he ever, he went like this. No, like, I'm not doing this. The only time he ever was like that. And he's like, I'm not going to come home from work and, and listen to you try and play drums. And I was like, but dad, you know, I really want yeah. to. And he was like, not happening. He's like, get a guitar. You can take it with you. And he goes, and if you really want to play guitar, we'll get you one, an electric with a volume knob so you can turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> so I got uh, the guitar, right? I was like, okay, cool. And I remember all my friends were like mad. They're like, we all play guitar. You know, you, you said you were going to be the drummer, bro. And I was like, I, dude, I can't. Yeah. So instantly was connected to it. Like, I mean, by the time I learned my, like, like my first riffs, which were like, like I said, electric funeral. And obviously I was like every other kid. I remember Seven Nation Army was right when that came out. And I was like, yeah. oh, hell yeah. You know what I mean? It's good. That's so, a great one for a beginner. Yeah, I even figured that one out myself. Yeah, it was great. So much fun to jam along with that. So like I was hooked instantly. And um, I was like one of those kids that started, you know, it would be like 20 minutes here. And then like it turned into like 40 minutes. And then it went to like an hour. And then it was like an hour and a half. And I thought I was so hardcore. And next thing you know, I swear, I was that kid that was in his room seven hours, you know, on a Saturday playing guitar. And, you know, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd play guitar before school. And then I'd bring it with me and play it during, you know, whatever. So by the time I was, I started when I was 15. And when I was 17, I actually um, went to um, the summer program at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Oh. And yeah, it was really cool. And at the end, they said, hey, you should try an audition for the school. And I'm like sitting there picking my nose like, what? Like, what are you talking about? And I auditioned for the school and I actually got a scholarship to go to the school. Oh, so great. I went to the school for six months and then I dropped out because it was totally not what I thought it was going to be. Um, I was learning how to conduct and write orchestral string arrangements. And I'm sitting there like obsessed with B.B. King and Buddy Guy and stuff. And I'm like, I just want to play the guitar. Yeah. So I left that school. My parents were mortified. And I said, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to figure it out. And at this time, I was like 20 ish, um, working a landscaping job, like just trying to save money to do whatever, playing in a cover band. And I was living with my parents and I said, I need to do something or this is not going to go anywhere. So I actually moved to Los Angeles when I was 21. And with the, like everyone with hopes and dreams of doing something right. And growing up in Wisconsin, you know, it's, it's basically it's cornfields. It's very rural. Right. Right. And I got an apartment in Hollywood and <laughs> it was like the movie scene where it's like, uh, where am I? Right. Yeah. But I went there and it was great. I mean, I hit the ground running and I didn't have anything. I, it, it got to the point where like my parents were like, you just got to come home. And I was I was on the floor of the guy that now plays drums with me. I was I was sleeping on his floor for like, I think it was like seven or eight months. Just like, it was pretty bad there for a while, yeah. but I never stopped. And I was like, man, I'm going to do this. So I started this trio under my name. And that's when I really, it was like going to school, cutting my teeth, you know, started writing songs. 
And we started to play like little shows in Los Angeles. Like our first big show was at the Viper Room. Monday night, six o'clock at the Viper Room. Right. You know? And then we got the gig. Okay, we're going to play every Monday or every other Monday at six o'clock. I was a rock star at that point. I was like, yes, I'm making it, right? Yeah. So after uh, a few years of kind of just kicking around, trying to do stuff like that, my first um, big break to call it would be uh, opening for Leonard Skinner at a motorcycle rally. Okay. <laughs> so after that, um, they said I, they were impressed with the way that I had played in my band. And they said, Hey, I said, um, they're like, what are you doing? I was like, uh, not much, man. I just drove all the way from Los Angeles to South Dakota to, to do this thing. And they said, well, we have some shows. Would you want to come open them? So then we went from playing to like two people to playing in front of 8,000 people with Leonard Skinner or whatever, you know? And after that, the ball started to roll and, um, I got someone to help me do booking and everything. And then it was like some ZZ Top shows and Glenn Hughes. And then we went out with Zach Wilde and Black Label Society and all these things. And then all of a sudden it was like things started to happen. So it's been, um, it hasn't been like a, a quick journey to say the least to get to this point right now where I'm at. But I would say um, I've definitely uh, been hanging out, trying to figure it out for for a long time. And, and I feel like finally though now, um, coming into my own as an artist and especially, you know, mu music wise, it feels really, really good now. And, um, I'm just excited for the future, but that's my short rundown of everything. But that's a really inspiring story because like you say, you know, you're, you're an incredible player and it wasn't easy. You know, you did have to go out there and do, you know, do the, do the road miles and stuff like that. And then you get a break, like opening for Leonard Skinner, and then it kind of snowballs a bit. Um, mm -hmm. What have you ever been offered? Because, you know, you think you're playing with all these incredible artists that you've played with. Um, have you mm -hmm. ever been offered? Because obviously guitar players leave the band. Have you ever right. offered a gig that's in like one of your hero bands and, and you're like, oh, I don't know, because I'm doing my own thing or. Right, right. That's a great question. There's been a few offers I've had to join like some like, uh, like there's a band called Blackfoot, which was like an old Southern rock band. Yeah, I was offered that gig. And then my name uh, was brought up for after Thin Lizzy, the Black Star Riders guys, that was brought to my attention. And even so I've, I've heard mumblings of like Skinner stuff. So I have heard things. Um, but here's my, my, my take on that. I would love to do all of that. But yeah. only under one condition, I still want to be able to do your own do stuff. Duty. Yeah, because I would love, I, honestly, um, I would love that. It would be like a dream come true to play with any of those bands or any other bands. And I would just want to make sure that um, I could continue doing my own music. And um, yeah, like with the, the Blackfoot thing, I remember I was like, oh, that'd be awesome. And the first thing they said, they're like, okay, you have to move to Florida. And at this point, I was like, oh, man, I'm just finally starting to find my groove, right? And they were like, we'd want you to be exclusive to the band. And I thought, you know, you know, you don't, I'm, I hate saying this, but you only live once, right? It's like, let's yeah. just shoot your shot and do your thing. Um, but yeah, great question. I have been offered a few and, you know, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't turn it down if it were the right thing, as long as I could do my own thing still. What would be the ultimate gig then? Who, who would you love to join? Oh, geez. That's a hard question. Um, I mean, I watched, and I, this is ne never going to happen, but I watched, I'm a really big fan of Doyle Bram Hall II. Yeah. And he was playing with Clapton. I was like, dude, I would back up Clapton. I want to I want to be in Roger Waters' band. Yeah. I would love to play his guitar parts because David Gilmore, obviously like all of us, huge hero. Yeah. Um, who else do I want to jam? Oh my gosh. I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I'll have to rack my head on that, but there's yeah, a ton. Yeah. That's good that's a good one clapton that makes sense doesn't it I oh mean, my gosh like yeah that would be so cool even even to just do a, uh because like i don't know about you but I'm, I'm such a fan of those music and like even when i'm not working on my own music like i like grab those records and still jam along to them i just love it i love clapton but beck beck was god in my eyes <laughs> oh for sure there's Beck was the one short list and both of them were on it yeah absolutely Definitely, definitely. And I know that you're a huge fan of Mountain. And oh, yeah. you actually played with Les Leslie West. And I always kick myself because about 15 years ago, I, I was going to New York and a friend of mine was friends with him. And he said, oh, why didn't you interview him? And, and yeah. so I'm emailing with him 
And I set up to do the interview and then something happened and I couldn't make it. And I oh, man, kick myself, kick myself with that one. Yeah, he was. So like, I feel like Mountain was like the, the U.S. kind of uh, answer back to Cream, right? Yeah. Like Cream broke up, everyone was doing their thing. And then this band comes out using the same producer this who's playing the bass in the band. For me, Leslie West, it was like, it was funny because I feel like he's almost like an underdog guitar player where yeah. a lot of people are like, oh, I've heard Mississippi Queen. It's good. It's like, yeah, it's slamming. But like, but as a player, he really had a cool, unique voice to the way he played. He was like, he was massive. Like he was a massive human, right? And he had this little Les Paul Jr. It was almost like a grizzly bear with like a stick, you know, with a microphone on it. Yeah. And I just loved like the way that he played and the energy. And I remember when I was starting in like my trio, I was trying to think to myself, I'm like, okay, I love Stevie. I love Hendrix, Beck, Page, Cla all of the guys. But I was like, what, like, what is my sonic sound going to be? And I remember I was so into mountain growing up and I just loved the, the rawness of it because it, for me, it kind of transcends. It's like blues, hard rock. Yeah. It's, it's, it's heavy, but it's still got soul in it. And, um, his playing really spoke to me. Him and Stevie were like the guys I remember when I first heard them, like Stevie when I was 15. And then Leslie, when I dug in, when I was like 20, I was like, this is the shit. I mean, mu that so why, much so that, that why you went for the P90s. Totally. Like, yeah. like I'm just staring at this guitar and yeah. like, this would have been like, you know, him, but like, yeah, that's why I went to the P90s. And, and all of a sudden I was like, man, I love this. And I think too, it just rings true about, you know, that everyone's unique. Like someone could play P90s like a guitar player and be like, oh, I, these sound, th whatever, you know? But for me, when I found that, I was like, oh, you know, your eyes light up in a way that you're like, there's, it, it ignites a spark that creates a fire. And I think Leslie did that for me, which was really great. No, definitely. I agree with you. And it is, it's a shame, isn't it? That he doesn't get more mentions when people talk about great guitar players because he definitely had his own sound and like you say, it was unique he was playing that junior les paul with the p90s and stuff like that he wasn't playing the strat or the totally you know. it is it is strange because you know there's i feel like um he's definitely like kind of an unsung guy and um it's it's kind of cool now because I do hear like uh, the other day I did this thing at a, a high school for the guitar kids in Nashville. It was like the Nashville School of the Arts. And this kid comes up to me. He's like 14 years old. And I'm like, dude, who do you listen to? He's like you and Leslie West. And I'm like, whoa, like I bet Leslie would be stoked that people are still, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just kind of cool. And I, I feel like, um, you know, I love that guy so much and his playing that it's, it's kind of fun for me because maybe some people haven't heard of him, like we said, and it's kind of hip to turn them on. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. That's part of your job, isn't it as well? That's, you know? It's the job description. Yeah. I'll show you something really cool. When, when I jam with Leslie, um, hold on one second. Let me grab this. He, uh, I played this guitar and, uh, I had it right. And it's, it's like one of the models before I did like a signature model, but, um, you I said, hey, man, will you sign my guitar? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, for sure. And I'm thinking he's going to, like, sign the back of the headstock or anything. The whole front. <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. Awesome, dude. So yeah. it just kind of hangs on the wall now. But I thought that was cool. That is super cool. And you're like, mm, that's not that's not vintage, is it? Because I know you've got you've got stories with your guitars, haven't you? I need you to talk oh, about sure. some of these stories. So what was that one then? What was What's that guitar you've got there then that he signed? This this guitar is a, it's just an Epiphone. So I did, um, I have like two models, Epiphone models out. And uh, this, before the model came out, they were like, hey, let's just give you some Epiphones and you can mess them up. And this is one, like I ripped the neck pickup out. No. I like put like some bolts in there and it's just a single P90. So this is, I played the heck out of this guitar. I mean, for an Epiphone, it's pretty trashed. Um, but I have a, a a few guitars that I have loves for. I mean, I could talk about them all day, but like this guitar, I got this guitar. It's a 1953. This is kind of my Jeff Beck. So Whip this is the one that you got given, wasn't it, by the guy from the Les Paul Forum? Is that the yeah, one? Yeah, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a beautiful. Uh, that is delicious. So that didn't come in that color, did it? It's been painted over, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can see there is gold. You can, I mean, it's probably hard to see, but you can see yeah. the gold and then yeah. there's the red over it. Um, do you want to see another really cool guitar? It'll take me like five seconds to grab it. Go and grab it. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, hold on. Give me one sec. It's still in the case from I was rehearsing till like 2 a.m. last night. Hold on a sec. Cool.
So check this out. So this guitar was given to me as well. I'm very lucky with people like giving me things, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you are. So this guitar, I'll tell you the story really quick. Um, I was on Instagram and this guy sends me a message and I'm sure this has never happened to you, right? One of those messages that said like sensitive content, right? Where you're like, uh, I don't know if I should open this. Yeah. And it's a picture of a guitar. And he goes, hey man, I know you like older Les Pauls. This guitar, I found it in my yard after a tornado in 2013. And I've had it hanging on my wall ever since. I wanted to ask you what you think I should do with it. Is it worth getting it restored? Blah, blah, blah. And it was like, and I, I hit him right back and I was like, hey, dude, you know, and he's like, oh man, I can't believe you responded, blah, blah, blah. And when I saw the guitar, I went, oh my God, that's a really, really old Les Paul. And I talk to him, I tell him all these things and I say, hey, if you ever want to get rid of it, because it's the internet, I had to shoot my shot, right? It's like, I, I was like, if you ever want to get rid of it, whatever, let me know. I would love to like get it up and running. And he's like, he calls me the next day. I had given my number. So he goes, man, I'm just going to give you the guitar. And I was like, there's no way. He goes, I didn't buy it. I'm not going to sell it. Um, the original owner's daughter who had it claimed it on insurance. He's like, it's just sitting here. I rather would have you have it and play it mm -hmm. than have it just sit. So the guitar is a 1952, early 52 uh, Les Paul. It's one of like the early prototype style models with the, the screws and the P90 here. You lucky so, Todd. I can't believe that you got given two vintage guitars like that. So check this out. The, the guitar was in a tornado. It went like four blocks to this guy's house. And check out the back of it. It's just super gnarly. Oh my God, I love it. I love every scratch though is a story, isn't it? That's part of it. It's Yeah, and I mean, the whole thing about it, like when I got it, I thought it was so cool. And I, and I thought to myself, man, like this is just an amazing piece of history. But then when I got it, there was so much more to the story. Like we looked at the pots, like, you know, here and mm -hmm. there's code so you, you could read, you know, when it was made. The pots are from 1951 and the Les Paul didn't come out until like 1952. So mm -hmm. we started to think, man, this is really early. And we didn't know exactly how early. And uh, a few really, really recognizable people told me it's like one of the first 25. Holy ever. So what, yeah. what, what do we beautiful. think that's, what do you, what do we think that's worth? Don't know. We um, don't know. Let's not talk about it. I don't know. I, ask. Um, but I will say this. I play it every day, and it's named Dorothy from the Tornado. I love that you give all your guitars names. I think it personalizes them. I think it's lovely. So is it, be is it beautiful to play? Does she play as good as she looks? It's the best one. Yeah. It's the best one. This guitar... To me, I had no, I had no reservations. Like, oh, I hope it sounds really great. I just thought it was cool. Then when I got it, even Joe is like, dude, that guitar is gnarly. So I got it and I plugged it in at this theater. It was like I got it from the guy who helped me fix it up. Yeah. It like honestly, I had the chills. It was so good. It's just, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful Les Paul, and I'm just so happy I have it to make music on. That's brilliant. Is uh, has Joe tried to buy it off you? No, because he knows I won't sell it to him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good. Don't. Don't let him have it. <laughs> he won't get this one. I'm going to keep this one. <laughs> He's got too many. He's got too many. So how do you, totally. after, how do you, after all these years, how do you keep kind of invigorating your playing? How do you keep the fire going? Um. Well, the biggest thing is I try to not take myself too seriously. I try and be in the moment and be present when I'm playing. Yeah. Um, I try and listen to new music all the time to stay inspired. Yeah. It's, it's really easy. I feel like as a player to get in a groove and to be like, all right, this is what I do. This is what I'm into, you know, and I'll talk about this forever and this is it, but I really try and branch out and listen to a lot of different music. And like I said, just don't take it too seriously. Just have fun with it. Just like the moment I picked it up, every time I pick up the guitar, I don't say, okay, I need to do something that's going to blow someone's mind or I better make sure this sounds really good. It's like, I just try and talk through the guitar. And that to me is 
that's that's what keeps it kind of you know interesting yeah yeah for sure it's nice that's great and so i guess i guess that's kind of it really it's been great chatting to you it's been really thank you so much thanks for listening to my rambling that is not no rambling whatsoever you've got some great stories (laughs) there and it's really inspiring i mean for me as like a new player and of course people that are listening um at home and stuff i'm sure they're going to be inspired by by kind of how how you sound and how you made it and you know your stories and your guitars and everything it's brilliant well i thank you and i hope we get to meet when i come to the uk and uh shoot maybe we can even jam that'd be awesome oh my god no don't that come would on, let's do it. that would be amazing but i would absolutely <laughs> die ask joe about my playing he'll tell you whatever i don't care it doesn't matter to me but um thanks so much for your time and it would be awesome to meet that'd be awesome yeah let's do it for sure so thank you for coming on and uh, i'll see you soon